It was Sunday night, October 30th, 1938, when we first learned that aliens had invaded at Grover's Mill in New Jersey. This report came over the radio airwaves on the CBS Mercury Radio Theater on the air. According to the news dispatches aired, local law enforcement was informed and curious folks had come to look. The local radio station arrived with a reporter who was able to report live from the scene to describe everything. The first alien spacecraft crashed into the surface of the Earth and for a time sat quiet. The Martians arrived. It was just a curiosity <laughs> until the aliens emerged from what seemed like a, a wreck to wreak havoc on peaceful citizens. In their advance, the aliens left nothing alive and nothing but barren, smoldering wasteland in their wake. The aliens had some kind of energy weapon that vaporized whatever it was turned upon. The military had no weapon that would stop it. These aliens advanced across the country, destroying everything in their path. Buildings, cities, people, machines, and aircraft. And then it went from really bad to even worse, as more alien aircraft crashed into the surface of the Earth. More aliens emerged, and the resulting chaos was the same. No one had to wait until the newspapers were printed. All of it was broadcast by a series of live, first-hand, as-it-happened reports, made possible for the first time by the medium of radio. Then, 60 minutes after it began, the radio play the War of the Worlds ended, as the invading Martians were rapidly killed off by a simple virus they had no defense for, and the Earth was safe again. Headlines. The next morning, the newspapers were filled with reports of mass panic and nationwide hysteria. There were vague reports of stampedes of people fleeing a non-existent, dramatized on the radio threat, and even suicides. The then 23-year-old Orson Welles, and the head of the Mercury Radio Theater on the air, found his name and face on the front cover of most every newspaper across the nation the next morning. Some learning that it was a radio play were printed as saying they would shoot Wells on sight. And that story of how a radio play in 1938 panicked a whole nation became the story. There are some sources claiming that the number of people listening was upwards of two million that night, that the War of the Worlds had traumatized an entire nation. But there are others who claim a different version of history is true. The huge viewership that was claimed in the papers the Mercury Radio Theater on the air had been struggling for its entire 17 weeks up till then. They had not even managed to find a sponsor for the program. The program, though syndicated by CBS, was broadcast out all over the nation. But most local stations preferred to play musical programs instead. One radio audience ratings company stated that the actual audience size was closer to maybe 5,000. So why all the fuss? A newspaper guy heard the radio play and made a realization. A real eureka moment, if you will. And not in a good way if you owned a newspaper. He realized that radio left unchecked was going to kill the newspaper business. It would get the word out in a fraction of the time that a newspaper could. And with improving technology, it would do it even faster over time. This little radio drama telling the story with scripted, on-the-spot, in-the-moment reports? It might have just been for entertainment, but our newspaper guy could see that radio had the ability to inform and influence the public with greater power and urgency than anything ever had before. So they hyped it. The big newspaper wrote highly sensationalized articles about how Evil radio had unnecessarily caused a public panic. 
how thousands had been frightened, fled their homes. The subtext, radio was new, untrustworthy, untested, new kid on the block. They were downright dangerous, kind of like the internet is now. Newspaper, on the other hand, they had wise people. They had time to take it in, understand it, and then edit the story. You know, get the story right. This radio thing was bad for news, not to be believed. But why this message? Even back then, they knew that they should never let a good crisis go to waste. Crisis should be used to move society where you wanted them to go, by the way you tell the story. And hey, if you got a problem without a crisis, no problem, create a crisis. We gotta keep selling newspapers. The fine art of exaggeration. So here's the ounce. You can find the fine art of exaggeration all over. Sometimes it's innocent, like it is in jokes or in stories told about the past. And by fishermen about the one that got away. Competitors in sports contests are sometimes prone to exaggeration about the flagrant foul that didn't happen, that should have been called, to say, writhe and pain on the field for effect. Sometimes it's more subtle. Politicians are often really good at it. But of course, it's not lies. It is a carefully crafted message that sounds like something it isn't. And you can also find it in a whole lot of advertising. Well, because when everything is rated number one, it does make you wonder. Commentators, opinion leaders, family and friends, how can you tell how accurate and true the message is? Well, in the moment, sometimes you just can't. But there is a way. And this little bit of wisdom comes from the New Testament. Matthew chapter 7, verse 16. By their fruits ye shall know them. Which can also be stated this way. What they might say sounds good, but what are the outcomes? What do they really get done? Look past the facade and see what is really going on. It is in their fruits, the fruits of their labors, their results, that you will know them. And when someone reveals who they really are in that way, by what they do, believe it. And that's it, an ounce submitted for your consideration. Well, thank you for watching and taking the whole thing in. Why don't you do us a favor and go ahead and subscribe, like and comment and share this with your friends so that everybody can laugh and think and smile and be amazed by the genius of an ounce. <laughs> yeah, thanks.